Good evening. Welcome to the Daniels faculty for the second full top lecture of the year. I'm Richard Sommer, the Dean of the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's, to tonight's featured speaker, Peter Rose. But before I make my introduction, I'd like to share a few words about our sponsor, Bulltop. Bulltop has generally supported lectures of the Daniels faculty since 2005. Its support has made, possible, has made it possible for us to feature speakers from around the world who are leaders in the fields of architecture and design. These lectures have provided the Daniels faculty with an opportunity to reach out to the broader design community by inviting members of our distinguished alumni and the general public to hear about new ideas, approaches, and research in the field. The Bulltop lectures are also invaluable to our students and faculty who benefit from the opportunity to hear from an expanded group of professionals and academics. Bulltop showroom here in Toronto at 280 King Street East, I got that right this time because sometimes I say West, I don't know why, uh, features beautiful living spaces defined by architecture, innovation, and precision. Bulltop also mounts exhibitions and events at their showroom fe featuring Toronto artists and designers, shows and events which I highly recommend to you. You can learn more about them at toronto.bulltop.com. I would again like to take this opportunity to thank Stefan Sibidlo, Principal of Bulltop Toronto, who joins us here this evening for his continuing sponsorship of the Bulltop series. On to tonight's speaker. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome my friend Peter Rose to the faculty tonight. If you somehow aren't already familiar with at least some of Peter Rose, uh, Rose's work, a quick visit to the firm's beautifully composed website will give you an introduction to the incredible range and architectural quality of the work. You will see in his lecture tonight that Peter's work spans from the scale of cities or parts of cities to the most refined and subtle of architectural details. His project includes city plans, such as his brilliant scheme for the old port of Montreal's waterfront, and that's an older scheme. I think he's gonna show some new urban design work tonight. And a, uh, and a more recent project for a housing tower at the uh, Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health, an 80-room housing tower set in the beautiful Berkshire Mountains of Massachusetts. And while I was putting together this int introduction, I was trying to think, and I'm gonna speak a little bit about the landscapes that uh, Peter has worked in, and I thought of that, um, that song that some of you of a certain age will know from James Taylor, where he, he sings about the Berkshires, and he says, the Berkshires seem dreamlike on account of that frosting with 10 miles behind me and 10,000 more to go. Now, Peter's from Montreal, or he's a native of Montreal, and uh, his, his most famous early work is uh, the grand building for the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal that I hope um, all of you have, have been to at least once, uh, even the younger members of our, of our uh, student body. But what you will not see on his website uh, is that a number of his early projects included houses and ski lodges in the Laurentian Mountains north of Toronto. Even before that, Peter's connection with architecture began with his, rela with his relationship to the Quebec landscape through his experience of Montreal as a place, his summers at the lake, and his time spent ski racing. My sense is that starting with those experiences in Quebec, Peter developed a distinctive eye and really a kind of smell for how a place is made for architecture in the landscape. In recent years, he has brought the sensibility back closer to, to uh, the Berkshires. Uh, uh, to, uh, he's brought them to bear on several kinds of projects, but especially on a number of stunningly beautiful crafted houses in New England. Another thing I should, think should be known when looking at his work is that Peter studied architecture, uh, well, both as an undergraduate and a graduate student at Yale, and this at a time when Charles Moore was the chair of architecture at Yale, and the whole constellation of talent that Moore surrounded himself with uh, were extremely influential at Yale and actually uh, in North America at the time. So I'm guessing some of you, the younger people in our audience, might not even know who Charles Moore is. Uh, I'm not gonna take a, a show of hands. <laughs> For the last 20 years or so, Moore's work is something that many of us have not talked about. 
because he was so much associated with the rise of the postmodern style in architecture. But now, this is a history that young people are rediscovering. And Moore was a particularly important figure in this period, both in the schools and among the leading designers. He was certainly as influential as Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, or in today's terms, akin to someone like Rem Koolhaas. As with Rem, Moore's students, his protégés, and his associates had an had, ha have had an incredible impact on the field. So it was Moore who, as an architect and a planner, explored and documented the organization of space in seemingly informal settlements, or what came to be understood as a vernacular landscape, and used these examples to counter the monolithic approach of late modern architecture. Moore broke down projects into small parts, each project becoming a village-like composition. Frank Gehry's work, which comes after Moore, and is to this day built on this process of, of, of aesthetic and an aesthetic of disassembly, in my view, would not exist without the direct influence of Charles Moore. You can see echoes of his ideas in work, uh, the work of many architects, including to, up to today in, in a Japanese firm's work like Sana. So I hope, Peter, you won't mind uh, me saying this, but when I look at a project like the East House, which I don't know if you're gonna show it tonight, uh, in Martha's Vineyard, I see the best aspects of Charles Moore and other figures like Louis Kahn, who would have been very influential uh, when Peter was first starting in architecture. In Peter's work, I see these influences distilled and taken to a level of sophistication and material development never imagined or achieved actually by Moore's generation. Many architects now speak about research in the context of architectural practice, but not so many have the time or frankly, intellectual wherewithal to really do it. Peter Rose is the kind of architect that has been intensely engaged in architectural research throughout his career. When he says, I quote, research is not an activity preceding design, but one that is integral to it, unquote, he really means it. His research is integral to his practice and to his lifelong commitment to teaching. He was an adjunct professor at Harvard's Graduate School of Design for 20 years. He has also taught at Princeton University, McGill, and here at the University of Toronto. And he's a frequent jury critic and speaker at symposia at many schools. Peter's work has, has received over 30 prestigious design awards, and as recently as this year, as recently as this year for the East House uh, at Martha's Vineyard that I just mentioned. His work has also been widely published in the popular and professional press, including Architectural Record, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Boston Globe, and the 2000 book, Peter Rowe, Houses, published by Princeton Architectural Press. His work has also appeared in numerous galleries and exhibitions, including the Museum of Art, Modern Art in New York, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Canadian Center for Architecture, which he also designed, and the Venice Biennale in Venice, Italy. Now, as I mentioned, Peter is a, a friend. We met as teaching colleagues at Harvard. My partner, Laura, and I have also worked at Harvard with Peter's partner, the brilliant historian and theorist, Eve Blau. In time, we all became friends, and spending time with Peter and Eve is one of the things we both miss about our life in Cambridge. On the positive side, Peter has given us some great pointers about how to become more Canadian. Um, so, uh, but one thing I want to admit is that until I got to know Peter more as a person, I did not understand uh, him as an architect. When I looked at his work and the work he demanded from students, I thought of him as the quintessential architect's architect. Everything, and I mean everything, had to be ingeniously conceived, relentlessly developed, and elegantly executed. Nothing but refined perfection would do. I thought of Peter Rose like the Swiss architect Peter Zumthor, but set adrift in the vulgar and insensitive architectural culture of North America. But in actuality, I later found that Peter rarely talked about the pursuit of architecture as an art um, when we talked about architecture and design and anything else. When I listened to him, his ideas, and what he cared about as a person, I found his curiosities and social consciousness at odds with my early impression. It is not that Peter doesn't want to make beautiful things, and he does, but he wants these things to make a difference, not only for the discipline of architecture and urban design, but what he, for what he believes these disciplines should have an impact on, or at least at a minimum, engage in terms of social 
and environmental the social and environmental challenges of our time. So I think you will see what I'm talking about if you can read between the lines and the images in Peter's talk tonight, which is entitled Strategies Across Scale. So please join me in welcoming Peter Rose to the podium tonight. Um, well, Richard, that was extraordinary. Um, and I'm, I now, well, I, 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 and thank you very much. And thank you to the hosts who I looked up on the web. And if I understand correctly, you do cabinetry at a very high level, sometimes for kitchens. And so there are a couple of kitchens in here. <laughs> Um, I mentioned to Richard <clears throat> that I intended to have a very succinct, concise talk. Um, uh, at least that was my ambition, and in that ambition I kind of failed. Um, what I've set out is a bit of a rambling uh, talk with more material than I can actually fit into the time frame that we have. Um, but, uh, and the excuse I have actually is I haven't spoken in Canada since I left 20 odd years ago. Um, and I sort of felt like I needed to tell everything that had happened since. <laughs> um, silly, but um, we're all childish in our own way. Um, um, so I, um, I will probably skip over certain things. Um, that are here or just jump over them um, in order to get to um, what I think are the probably the more important uh, bits and pieces of the talk. And Richard's wonderful, lovely introduction um, identified many uh, really important parts of my background. I mean, certainly Charles Moore, who I, who's, who I turned against in a way um, because Postmodernism was a, a real curse for those of us who grew up in it, um, but w was an extraordinary man, a real, just a wonderful, incredibly intelligent, talented, generous, thoughtful guy. Um, uh, school was very interesting. Yale was at the center of things at that time. I mean, um, Sterling was teaching there, and Venturi did learning from Las Vegas with my class. Khan was there. Aldo Van Eyck was there. I mean, it was, it was an, an amazing time. But mostly what I remember was the time we spent outside of class and outside of school. We used to take trips uh, at the drop of a hat and travel with Charles Moore. And I remember once on some trip with a bunch of students looking at a building and I said, I thought jokingly, because I thought it was humorous, do we like that, Charlie? And waited to hear uh, what he would say. But I realized that that was uh, spoken humorously, but it was totally true. I had no idea what I was doing as a student, and I had no idea how to make decisions. I was simply soaking in whatever I could um, from, my, from the people around me. And there is a moment in this talk where I, will, I might say that I began to know what I was doing. Um, so uh, it's interesting to be at a school, a good school, a wonderful school, where students are learning things without knowing how they'll be useful or um, whether they'll be useful. Um, but the more... Um, but I, in any case, I was, I was great. Whoops, suddenly this is different. Do I, I'm not working it from my computer. Um, all right, so let's, well, this, this will work. And there, there are three little tiny videos that require clicking, like a minute each, so I don't know how to do that without my computer. So I, I'm going to talk, I, I, my practice, our practice is very diverse. Um, we do, 
certain number of buildings. We've always done research. Uh, I, I've always thought research was buying time to figure out what you should do. Um, because I never know at the outset of any project. Um, and we've always done quite a bit of master planning. And I sort of believe in urban design, whatever that is, um, I kind of believe that that's part and parcel of what we do as well, that any project is part of a larger context and without understanding how it plays. It's like an actor in a play, you have to know a lot about the background, the other people. Um, so. These are my partners, both former students, um, very interesting people. These are, these are cronies, really. We do everything kind of collaboratively. We've been working on a project in Turkey. Um, Matthias Schuler, who founded Transolar, very interesting firm, half mechanical engineers, half physicists. We do very highly sustainable stuff, but without him, we couldn't do it. He's a wonderful guy. Michael Van Valkenburg, you will know. Uh, I, I, Richard's dead on. I grew up in the Quebec landscape. I love the landscape, the idea of it, have a great deal of respect. I've actually written once that it, when we do buildings in places like Vermont and on Martha's Vineyard that the landscape's in some ways more important than the architecture. I think I may regret that I wrote that, but. And then Richmond, so, um, so Michael's in New York, Matthias is in Stuttgart, Richmond's in Los Angeles, and, but those are, our, those are the guys we work with on everything. So this is just some fairly basic stuff, but that research, uh, time to figure out what you're doing. It, 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 it's most architectural projects demand a fairly accelerated pace, or a lot of them do, and we're constantly looking for ways to slow it down so we can figure out where we're going. We call it research. Um, uh, uh, I would say that whenever we have it, part of the research is looking not only at a local site, but at every possible force back in time, out into the future, and out into space that can play a role in the thinking. Um, and obviously architectures for about the long term. A friend of mine introduced me to this diagram uh, called the decision-making cone. I don't know how familiar it is. As we get more and more into research that's not specifically architectural, we're learning business terms and we're, we're, we're sort of collaborating with non-architects. So this is a sort of dreadful thing, but it's the space of, of problems. Um, and at the very left-hand side is when a problem just is barely a problem, and at the right-hand side is when it's a solution. And architects are most typically hired here um, when a lot of the decision-making has been done, when the program is done, the site's picked, the budget, and any number of other things. And we would argue that we are well qualified and trained and disciplined to be in on things more at the strategic, at the beginning. Um, and then there's a, I've, I've had a lot of tricks to, um, or explanations for habits that I have, which are, I, all, I was criticized for, but I, it's too late now to change them. But one of them is not focusing on the problem <laughs> at hand and daydreaming and sort of, you know, drifting into other spaces. But there's, a, there's some theory uh, actually in business schools, that if you're trying to solve a problem, looking at parallel industries is actually something worth doing. So this is the kind of drifted decision-making cone. And then this is the, um, so I'm advocating for research and strategic thinking, which, is, which takes time that a lot of clients don't have the patience for. Um, in, in fact, a colleague, of ours at Harvard, who's the head of the um, urban design program, a man named Rahul Mahotra, uh, Mirotra, he's spoken here. So, you, so he's, he's, he uses a term called impatient capital, which I think is a fabulous one. And it's just the need for money to be processed as quickly as possible. So we try and slow that down. And in our group of 
collaborators, that little, that little place there where you're thinking, doing research, we would argue that the, the result is better um, where, uh, than a linear approach, but it's also known affectionately as the belly of disappointment within which you're likely to get fired. Um, and then this is, so I, I'm very in, interested in the difference, knowing, understanding the difference between strategy and tactics. And this is a kind of beautiful one, which is ironic also, because if there's nothing to do when you're playing chess, you've already lost. But a more typical strategy tactics discussion could be framed by, in military terms, uh, tactics is, uh, figuring out how to take an army over, the mount, over a mountain and strategy is trying to figure out whether or not it's a good idea. Um, other, I, somehow, I, I went to Yale almost by accident. I applied on my own. Um, uh, my parents were sort of against it. I arranged for my own interview for the SAT tests and I went without ever visit, visiting. But it was, a, it was a wonderful blessing for me. It got me away from a situation uh, at home that was, I didn't think, particularly good for me. And it exposed me to a, a world of things, including some wonderful museums, two of which were built by Lou Kahn, and, and a, a, del, a delight, uh, an affection for art, um, and an interest in art. Not knowing what to do with that, but I'm just kind of drawn to it. And so um, Di Maria's lightning field, worth a trip, it's almost nothing, it's just a bunch of chrome posts, but it tells you about distance, it tells you about topography. They're sometimes there, the sun's setting behind, it, it makes them pink, but when it's overcast, the, the, the poles go completely away. It's nothing about lightning, it only strikes about once a year. Um, and, and Robert Irwin's pieces with Scrim, where tiny, tiny devices, I mean, and it's very, very much about theater, but tiny devices change everything. So int I'm interested in how, in these kinds of phenomena and these effects, because architecture is a, has the capacity just in doing its job to create spaces that are emotionally powerful, psychologically powerful, um, work with weather and light and everything else. So I've always been drawn to these things. I've made uh, more excuses to take students on trips to places like Marfa and Dia Beacon. And um, so to Terrell, you know, what, what's interesting is that these are holes to the sky at the bottom and that's just a projection in the corner of a gallery. And from a trip to Marfa. So that's Richard Serra and Donald Judd. Richard Serra, there was a wonderful grant program when Richard Serra and Bob Irwin and James Terrell were all just out of school and you could get money to do whatever you wanted um, as long as you partnered with someone in either industry or in science. And Terrell and Irwin actually went to uh, General Motors is somewhere and they wanted to go in an anechoic chamber, a place where you go and there's no sound. Your voice goes out and you can hear the sound going away but it doesn't bounce back. And they each went in for an hour separately, or an hour, two, three, it's, it's, they've both written and spoken about it. And there's a, um, a comment by Irwin who said, they opened the door, I took one step, but I just couldn't take the second step because it was so interesting. There was dirt on the floor and the sound was deafening. And so a kind of I impulse that they developed, both of them really, for slowing things down so you could see a little bit more effectively, more acutely. Um, and Sarah, Got, a, got some money so he took to work in a steel yard. His father was a ship, worked in the, in the shipbuilding industry and he just played with a crane and lifted these things until they fell over. And if, you've, if you know Sarah's work, it's terrifying. It takes your, there are moments when, when the 
the smell of the steel and the sense of the kind of tipping, the tipping quality of it makes you stop breathing. Um, and then th these are, this is, this is a, a testament. I, I, Richard's right on, in, on <laughs> I, I, so many counts actually. He's, he's been a very good friend of ours for a long time, but this is a so, sort of psychological portrait I wasn't prepared for. <laughs> but, but Judd's pieces are a kind of testament to the pursuit of unpromising ideas. Um, dumb boxes, all he fixed were the dimensions. He began in plywood, and you would have, if in architecture school, you wouldn't, you wouldn't last for a second with a scheme like that. And I, I would argue that Kahn's work is mostly unpromising ideas. And if you look at the early drawings of the Kimball, or, I mean, the Yale Art Gallery is just a box, and the other, the British Art Center is a box, and Kimball's a bunch of bars. And, but so he just, set some rules for himself, and these are all the same size, there are a hundred of them, they're made of mill aluminum, but this one here is open in such a way that the sun that's shining in here bounces, and there's probably a piece in the back that's reflecting it. So you walk into this room, it looks like the pieces are all the same, and one of them is just screaming at you, this one here. You look through and it sort of seems like there's nothing there and the view is the same but it's kind of distorted and you move a couple of feet to the left and that one goes dark and another one starts screaming at you and you begin to be aware of the fact that the relationship we have with things is quite active. It's, um, and so, and Charles Moore actually talked about buildings being, boy, I'm never gonna get through this talk because of Richard, but, <laughs> He, talk, he talked about choreography as that buildings are like dance choreographers. They make you move. They, they set up forces and conditions that cause you to move, sometimes gracefully, sometimes not. And great buildings make you feel sort of in control and calm. I, I mean, I, I don't, I just that choreography is, is something worth considering. So I was a ski competitive skier, and I developed a theory about my, the connection between skiing and architecture, which was that if you're, I was a good downhiller, not because I was fearless, not because I was a great athlete, and I certainly wasn't that strong, but I had confidence in my ability to see myself moving through space quickly without danger, and in different conditions of um, sun and, and shadow and weather and stuff. And there's this guy here, it's a guy named Valentino Rossi, who's for a while, five or six years in a row, was the best motorcycle racer in the world. And he had this uncanny ability to just know how he could slip through a group of other bikes on a race so calmly, um, undramatically, but it's, I think, something that, that certain people have, it's like an ear in music that you can understand and see space with some subtlety. I think it's quite important in architecture and it's one of the few things that I think I know how to do. So I said I'm gonna do master planning, urban design, which we do quite a lot of, some research and then some buildings at the end. I'm gonna blast through the master planning. Um, uh, but I would say that the CCA, which, was, which is known as a building, was thought of actually by Phyllis and, and also by me as an urban repair. We, it was located there because that part of the city was falling apart. And it was falling apart because there were these, uh, there were four highway ramps that had knocked down a bunch of buildings and just created a condition of undesirability. And the CCA kind of patched some of that up. The ramps, in a way, disappeared. We created a park here. And so it was, in its own way, a, a piece of urban design. And, and I credit Phyllis, actually, with re reinforcing, if not instilling in me, the need to do research the need to know about the materials you're working with, the sites you're working in, 
um, and so on. And then, so we won a competition for the Port of Montreal. Um, we did, our proposal was that the, the, this is just sort of the port through its history. It's a really interesting artifact. Uh, but our proposal was that it be, that it, it, having looked at the history, it was really the, the engine of the Canadian economy in the late 19th century, early 20th century. It's where the sea lanes from Europe met the rail lines that went all over the North American continent and to the Pacific. And there were, there were just fabulous things that happened there. It was a bit, the capacity to move trains and empty rail cars by shaking them, to move grain to Europe and other goods from Europe to here, it was a bit like the computer business the, in the, of recent years. The port got bigger and bigger and bigger and the mechanisms got more and more robust. And these are the buildings that Le Corbusier and Gropius was very fond of, were very fond of. And so we just said, this is too important for private investment. Uh, it should remain in the public domain. We won a competition based on, on that proposal. Um, we then bought some, t I don't, don't know, after we won the competition, the budget wasn't set for, for our work and we created a six month window to do some research and we went through all the archives of the port and of the city and we located some actually really funny stuff that some engineers, there, there, we, we, uh, we uncovered some fraud, um, but we also uncovered that the canal had been filled in during Expo without doing any damage to it, um, and that most of the foundations were, um, were still just under the places where they'd knocked the grain elevators down. Politicians would knock grain elevators down just before an election, announcing the progress to come. Then if they won, they'd do nothing. If they lost, they'd do nothing. Um, and, but, but, uh, but what we discovered that I think was our most in interesting, in some ways, most important um, achievement was that this could be dug out. This, is, this had all been filled in, and it was, it was just beautiful. It was um, limestone and big pieces of, of iron, and, um, and we dug it up, and what, what happened was that our project here, which was about a mile in length, extended another 15 miles to Lake St. Louis and all the buildings that were really at risk on the canal because the canal was gradually filling in suddenly became iconic again. And there are some of the great places now they've been re uh, uh, rehabilitated as housing and other functions. So, and then there's just, we, we, we lit the grain elevators. That was another great thing uh, with a crazy lighting consultant friend of mine. Um, and then artists do, do things there. Um, so, quickly, one other uh, piece of urban design, actually, I have no idea how we're doing for time, but um, we were chosen, to, we, we submitted, uh, I, along with, with Schuler, Van Valkenberg, um, a mobility consultant from Italy um, uh, who used to work with Systematica, famous Milan-based transportation people, and a bunch of others. We put together a team and a proposal, and we were chosen one of five teams out of 80 to do a paid competition uh, for this uh, piece of Helsinki, which had formerly been um, a container port, just as Montreal, Montreal's port had, was a container port. They get too unwieldy, too big. You move them uh, out of the main part of the harbor. So this came free, um, and, uh, and we did a competition for it. So it's a very elaborate competition, which I'm going to present in a couple of minutes. Um, but this is Helsinki. For those of you who uh, have never been, I, it's a great place to go, um, better in summer than winter, but it's, um, it's very far north. And, this is a sort of famous piece of public space called the Esplanade, where uh, Alto's bookstore is and all of the 
companies that make all the great sort of Finnish crafts that we like to buy are located. And then there's a big department store here called Stockman that forms a pivot and there's a very beautiful street that drifts down through this part of Helsinki and it goes, this, there's a hill here as well. And um, you can see that Helsinki, like many other cities, is, uh, except other than places like New York and Savannah, uh, is, non, is Cartesian, local Cartesian planning. So many grids that are crashing into each other. Um, what we also noticed was that this, all of the infrastructure and all of the sort of clues about the container port uh, had to do with the fact that it was connected to rail lines that went straight, well, went through the station and straight north, uh, east to Russia, west to Scandinavia, or highways that did the same. So we were looking for ways of uh, un changing that and finding, a, making this a piece of the city that would be in 25 years or so as embedded, as logical, as normative as could be. Um, th then th these are the, here's Itala and Artek and there's Stockman and so basically our scheme was to imagine that it was, I mean, we, there was a lot of work to manage to the connection here. We actually were reshaping the water uh, land condition. We we're creating a kind of large street here and so on. So that's just how we were connecting. Um, we organized it. It's just a very basic plan, but the streets are oriented north-south. This is a proposal by the uh, urban, the uh, city planning, a bit like American suburban curvy road planning. But if you do this, you get nine times more sun, which means in winter when the sun is 11 degrees above the horizon at noon, you actually might not try to hurt yourself. <laughs> um, I don't know, I have this thing about northern morbidity and the correlation between heavy drinking and northern climes. I mean, I can, I, I, I'm in Canada, so I shouldn't say that, but in, in, I get into trouble in the U.S. all the time talking about northernness. But, so another thing, we, with Michael, we, we were trying to think about the ground plane and we were trying to, it was a very environmental project, so the ground plane and the gardens and the surfaces were all set up so that when the water ran off into the Baltic, it was drinkable. But that meant that we had to tilt it and we calculated that a 1.4% tilt would work for water. What it did was instead of, as opposed to flatness, it increased your view of the water by 400% which means that in winter, when the sun is in the south, it's bouncing, not, it's coming not only from the sky, but it's bouncing off the water and flickering. And then there was a very intense um, mobility strategy. Cars are, uh, this is car pollution in terms of amounts of carbon in the air per kilometer, just a little bit more than an airplane. Um, they take up a huge amount of space and they clog everything. But everyone has one and Finns are, are driving just as uh, to this, the same degree that, that, that Americans are. So what we were trying to do is create a transitional plan that would allow the car lovers to continue to love and have their cars, but offer them something that might wean them of at least the daily use of the car. So the plan, you could drive everywhere, but, but, not, but not park. Um, uh, if, you, uh, if you had an electric car, you got to park within a couple of minutes or three minutes of where you lived. If you had an ordinary car, your car was within six minutes parked and there were tram stops within a couple of minutes. And this is just a, a sort of isochrone drawing that I really like by, um, our, by Federico Paralato, which just shows um, it, it shows many things, but one, it shows how close you are to public transport. So this is what we were proposing. This is downtown, but you're a little further from public transport and you're really far from it here, so you spend a lot of time in the car there. An armature for flexible growth, sort of self-explanatory, 
um, we had an energy strategy so that it would be carbon zero um, relatively soon out. So I'm going to skip over this. Um, it's a project I did for, in collaboration with a, a Harvard uh, research physician, an infectious diseases doctor named Anne Goldfeld, who's a good friend of mine. And she'd been hired by the Ethiopian government to develop a TB strategy um, for a huge TB problem that they have. And I worked on it with Matthias and with 12 students. We went to Ethiopia a couple of times. It was really interesting. And um, I'm just going to take my word for it. It's a terrible problem. And the solution, actually, is it's the sort of opposite of Paul Farmer's. Anne is, an, is the anti-Paul Farmer, for those of you who know about the great Paul Farmer. Um, and what Anne has developed is way, are, are ways of treating community-based treatment, because you need to treat people for six months continuously every day. Uh, and if they stop, they become reinfected. So um, this was just a, a proposal for many, many um, clinics, hundreds of clinics, local, lo located in, dispersed in the countryside and uh, off the grid and with another program uh, kind of as a camouflage because there's a stigma to um, TB. Uh, TB is uh, often, it's a co-infection with HIV. So these are my guys and these are, this is the architecture school. I, it, it was a fabulous experience, I mean, deeply moving, troubling, but fabulous experience. When I came back, I took, I rented a plane and we flew to Lalabella, which is the place where, uh, I mean, from Addis to Lalabella, where these underground, these churches that are dug into the ground are located. And I, it was all, we were just hoping that things would work out, but I, in the back of my mind, I was going to cancel the Lalabella trip if the plane or the crew didn't look trustworthy. And when I came back, I, I was told by um, the woman who, uh, uh, who was responsible for the money that, that they would have been very unhappy if I'd killed 12 Harvard students. <laughs> That's all she said. Anyway, so, so another piece of research. This is a sort of a little bit of an innocent slide. There should be a big title. But we, we've been hired to do a research basically the, into how it might be possible to deliver better housing at lower cost. The perception being that housing is not very good in America. It's a bit of a crisis. It's always too expensive, and it's not so good. So very quickly, and so progress. This is Levitt, 1949. This is Clayton, 2014. Gotten eight bucks cheaper over whatever is that time frame, 60 years. And the plan is much better, those of you experts can see. Um, but in, but so, so, so this is a, a research with lots of collaborators and design will be a huge part of it. Thinking about where in the city and what, at what scale and energy and all those other things. But also we're beginning to think about the production. So how can we intervene in, we're calling produ it production, but it, it's construction. So there are a few little comparisons. Cell phone, 4,000 bucks, 1983, didn't do anything. 14 bucks, 2014. Computer, cameras, extraordinary. I mean, this was a digital camera, not even, a not very good one. There were, there were film cameras, but you can see there's a bit of progress. Um, bikes have gotten, I like riding bikes, so, a lot better. I have always liked BMWs. They're just tons better. They're the same price in 2014 dollars, more or less. They're more economical, they're faster, they are cleaner, blah, blah, blah. So this is, this is um, a graph that pits construction against other generic industries, but that you can pick any number of them in terms of productivity. Everything else has gone up. and. 
Canada's a little better than the United States, but it, it's a bit of a, um, it, well, it's, it's interesting construction. So we are, we are doing, we're looking at other, we're, we're looking at, first of all, at construction, and then we're going to look at some other things to try and understand if there's a way that we say this company, this is a big, heavily funded project, and one of the possibilities is to fund a company that would develop, construct, design housing. And there's an interest in making a profit, but there's also an interest in doing some good. This is a, I can't tell you who the, who's funding it for the moment. But so you go back and you look at people like Jean Prouvet, who says in 1945, if this country needs a new industry, it's a building industry. Hmm. Interesting. Um, develops these beautiful, but one of my favorite characters is Jean Prouvé. Um, systems that were dimensionally calibrated so they could be transported by, uh, by truck, by plane. Um, so that these things, <laughs> uh, mo no module weighed more than 100 kilograms, ideal weight for two men to carry, not two men I know, but, um, <laughs> and then, and, and it, it failed. Uh, some other people bought it and then it just stopped. So Gropius and Voxman, an idea for the packaged house, sort of panelization and special universal joints, all panels um, made 200 houses failed. Um, so actually we've been looking at the housing industry and there's a, there are a lot of prefab companies and MoMA did a show called Home Delivery a few years ago, and all of those companies made only a marginal difference and they n none of them made any significant money. Um, uh, but, but a company that's, that I've known about a lot but is way more interesting, as I look at it carefully, is Levitt. Um, father and two sons, one son worked for Frank Lloyd Wright, was a pretty good architect. They don't look like much, but those houses were really well thought out. And the other guy had been in the Army, or the Army, Navy, I'm not sure. He was a CB, uh, construction battalion. So people who had to build air, airfields in four days um, or risk being overrun by the enemy. Um, a, a highly, uh, what, I'm supposed to? OK. Now I, this is much less ergonomically comfortable. Um, so it, interesting three guys. Um, most of the prefab companies, the best of them, Blue Homes and nine or 10 others, build about 80 homes a year. Um, Levitt was building 180 houses a week. Um, they uh, broke it, it was highly systematized. This was the, the CB son. Um, so there were teams. There's a, uh, that, well, so it's, and everything was thought through. So everything was pre-cut, pre-bent, um, combat loaded, term from the military, so that the stuff on the top of the truck was what you used first, what you unloaded first. Um, uh, on the first day, they sold 1,400 homes. And they also, they, they also tackled the financing. It was post-war, post-Second World War. There were government programs. So you could, your mortgage and down payment were the same. So you, effectively, you, you, what you paid to rent became what you paid to, to acquire. Um, uh, anyway, quite remarkable. They also made a lot of money. And they, it was a bit like, the inverse of an assembly line. They had teams which would move from foundation to foundation to foundation. So the teams moved, there was no assembly line moving, but it was, a, they calculated the number of nails, they cut all the wood beforehand, et cetera, et cetera. So interestingly, now, now we move outside. We're looking for tech, for, uh, at uh, other industries for technologies or strategies that we might transfer, possibly. Um, just straight business school stuff. So interestingly, if he's the great genius in terms of the creation of the idea and the product, equally, 
the current president is, uh, plays, has played a huge role in this company becoming the most profitable company in the world. His background is as supply chain guy. He's, he is the supply chain guy. And supply chain stuff emerges in all these other businesses. And I asked myself, who's the supply chain guy on a construction site? Um, and so he, one of the things he did, he reduced the number of suppliers from 100 to 24. Basically, not reducing the number of parts, but getting various people to take responsibility for all of these things and providing what we call a sub-assembly. Um, they managed inventory so that they went from 30 days worth to two days worth. And then this is a very interesting thing. Uh, the um, total cost of an, of an iPhone, 560 bucks, $178 of components. Because of the sub-assemblies, final assembly is $7 worth of time spent by Foxconn in China and Apple's margin is $368. So I like cars. Cars were an easy thing for me to look at. Um, Rover has a partner, which is DHL. And so Rover does the assembly, but the moving of anything anywhere outside the factory, around the factory, around the world, or in the factory, is by DHL. So this is the ro rover uniform. If you're a rover guy, this is the DHL uniform. He's moving an engine. You don't touch it if you're a rover because you don't know about moving. DHL knows about moving. And so they, um, so by a process of, of optimizing the movement of things, they were able to reduce the size, the square footage that they needed by, by almost 75%. And the rover site holds an average of 0.9 days of stock, which seems to be sort of optimum. So then there's, so, so you keep looking. The key guy at Tesla is the supply chain guy. Again, the, the CEO, or not, uh, uh, Elon Musk is CEO, but the guy under him who actually runs the place is a supply chain guy. So Tesla, um, so there's a whole sort of study of supply chain optimization. And this is what the factory looks like. And I heard Elon Musk, Elon Musk talked at the 100th anniversary of the MIT Department of Aeronautics and Astrophysics. Aeroastro, it's called. It's a much cooler name than architecture somehow. I would be there if I was 18. Um, and he, he gave a wonderful sort of interview um, uh, with the head of the department, a guy named Jaime Pereira. And uh, someone said how fabulous the Tesla was, what a great machine it was. And Musk said this, which I thought, which just, just struck me. He said, designing the machine that makes the machine is a task of far greater difficulty than designing the machine itself, perhaps by a factor of 10. So my sense is, that the same would apply that designing the construction process, if there, it may not be possible, but someone's asked us if we want to try and we said, why not? Um, but the key, in a sense, for Apple and for Rover and for Tesla is not the thing that they sell, but the process which produces the thing. Um, and then Boeing is right up there. Boeing reduced the number of parts from 747 to 787 by down to a third. The way they do it is, it used to be that all the parts came to the factory and they put them together. Now all the parts go to, par to partners at two levels who assemble a bunch of them into sub-assemblies and then bigger sub-assemblies. So these are parts that are made elsewhere, um, outsourced. This is how they transport. <laughs> in this fabulous plane. And so everything is designed to make sure it can fit in that beast. So the, so the design process has, there are many masters or many uh, parts of a program that inform the design requirements. And I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in this. Um, and then lastly, this is BMW's. BMW bought 
identified, they have an energy strategy like Tesla. They are making electric cars. They bought a carbon fiber factory um, because they identified weight as being one of the key things. So uh, it allowed them, and I, so they're, they're produ they, by owning the factory and optimizing it for them, they reduced the cost of carbon fiber by 67%, half the amount of material, and I can't remember what, the weight reduction is wild, and a third the number of parts because you can mold carbon fiber to be things that would be multiple parts in other materials. And then, I don't know if this shows up. So this, so we're finding all this stuff and part, part, one of the great things about research is that the rules are a little loose and it's a bit like going into the stacks of the library and if you find something by accident that isn't quite on topic, you kind of spend some time looking at it. This is a drawing by a guy named Daniel Whitney, an MIT faculty guy in 2006. It's called a Bourgeot liaison diagram, but it shows of a V8 engine. So kind of beautiful drawings here, but this just shows every part in a V8 engine and what it's connected to. So crankshaft, block, and head. And so we're trying to do a liaison diagram of a very modest building, and it's a really hard thing. And no, okay, so now I need to, I, I'm about to head out into the last piece of the talk, but th this is a little video. You can use your mouse. What? Mouse. Oh, mouse. Okay. So this is Prouvé's, one of Prouvé's houses being assembled by four people in a day. And, and so he designed everything to fit on one truck, everything to be liftable by two people. Um, the sequence of assembly was crucial, so he designed everything with a sense of what came first, especially key in this move here. So those are heavy pieces. But they're, they're hinged, so you lift them up, put a couple of panels. And I, again, I, I, I'm not sure if it was this, this thing, I think was at MoMA. But Prouvé is, is, is a, for those of you who don't know him, is a wonderful figure to s study. Okay, so. Is that John? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know John. I, I want to hope that they're original, but I, they look distressed, so they might be original, and I know there are a lot of original parts around, and there were a lot of buildings. This building, there were quite a few built, but that window doesn't look original for sure. <laughs> but, it's, but it's marvelous to think, I mean, if you think of a design problem, in the context of the truck and the men and how much they can lift and the sequencing of things, it's a different design problem. Maybe we shouldn't be doing it, but okay, so see. So a bunch of guys, four guys one day. Uh, in one day four guys in a bunch of four guys in five seconds by stop motion photography. <laughs> the 36 men who built this house. So you can... Um, another day, another 40 houses. You could imagine that the choreographic notation by someone like Mark Morris being written for that. 
um, those, they, everyone had a place to stand, everyone had the stuff that they needed, and I, I have to say, I, I think I didn't say this before, Levitt made a lot of money. Um, uh, I, I mean, so now, so this is, this is transition. Uh, the conclusion we've gotten very, very early in this research is that, that, that construction, and it may not be fixable, but is a bit of a joke, really, compared to these other industries. It, it just, it's, I was saying that if that we're in Canada, I used a hockey metaphor and people just looked over my head like I was crazy, but it's as if, if you use a hockey metaphor, these other industries are like NHL teams and the construction industry is sort of a pickup game in a street where three guys are playing five. And so this is an example of, this is just, it's not entirely relevant, it's just something I like. <laughs> but it is kind of relevant. <laughs> Racing, but also in industry, the, the focus on time. Every piece of wasted time is a piece of wasted money. Um, so, all right, so now we're going to race through a few buildings. Um, this, well, so I, I built a building in Cambodia. I don't have a photograph. That's Anne Goldfeld, the woman we did the stuff in Ethiopia for. Um, this was the hospital that we added on to. These all, are all kids who've had TB and have been cured by Anne's program, and I have no picture of the building. All we did was arrange the plan a bit because we just couldn't affect, people couldn't read drawings that we would do and understand how air would move. We were trying to keep fresh air flowing through the clinic. But that's, so I, I would say that's architecture. Um, uh, this is a, Project, I have, I have no idea how much time we have. We've got 20 minutes more? Yeah. Okay. okay. So I was asked to do an art gallery for contemporary art in Carpenter Center, um, a daunting challenge. Um, my reverence for uh, Le Corbusier knows almost no bounds, and this is a building that was protected by Boston, by Cambridge, by America, by the Le Corbusier Foundation, by every possible agency looking at buildings. And our, our project was just a little, whoops, what did I do? Um, I may have, I hope this isn't a sign of, okay. So we just, we placed a box uh, off Le Corbusier's grid um, with some space for mechanical because there is very terrible mechanical in this building and a little cafe. And so the locating of this thing was very carefully done to not disturb the building to somewhere between deference and um, assertiveness was the delicate ba balance that you play when you, rel when you renovate something or add something to Le Corbusier. So it's just at the top of the ramp. It's it's mostly plywood, but it's covered with a shield of um, cold rolled steel. You can see into it up the ramp, um, and it's uh, removable, removable without a trace. So a very minor project, but a very interesting uh, one with a very modest budget. In, at the same time, um, it was a quid pro quo. Uh, Jim Cuno gave some money. Um, for studios in, uh, Jim Cuno was the director of the Harvard Art Museum 
uh, in return for having a, a contemporary art gallery in Carpenter, he, he paid for some studios that we built in some squash courts. So basically this was doing almost nothing. Um, there was a roof here and we, it was facing north. We think that it was glazing when the building was built in the 1880s. Uh, for squash back then. It was, it's not useful because it's uh, not an international squash court. The dimensions are wrong. And so we added air, we added lights, um, we painted the floor, we added that skylight, and that's all we did. So in part, uh, thinking again in terms of being strategic, and being strategic and tactical, but strategically we were trying, we had no, well actually we had no money, so we were being strategic out of budget. A uh, house in New York that we did, we oh, where we had some money. <laughs> um, I, I just figured out that the budget for this and the budget for Kapala were the same. Yeah. House, house for a family of seven and a residential tower with 80 rooms, same budget. I, I can tell you the fees were different. So um, on 64th Street, basically our goal was to bring daylight into the building all the way down to the ground and to, this is a little model, and so there's an upper courtyard and a lower courtyard separated by a thin layer of glass. and. Um, the second goal was to allow, there were three. Um, one was to bring light in, the other was to sort of de-verticalize it. It's very high and there's an elevator but that seemed like a kind of drag and most stairs are, well, I, I'm very interested in stairs both as means of moving up and down and, but experiencing them which you can do better when they're more gentle and, and they're also very theatrical. So. This, there are two sets of very gentle stairs, quite theatrical stairs. And then the last sort of goal was to democratize. These, these houses were power houses. They were all about the axis and everything, where, where the important parts were and where the not important parts were. So while the central axis is along here and marked by those two uh, aperture into the dining room and the garden, a line, all the movement is off and you, whoops, and you can, people perform in that corner of music, you can give a speech there, you can give a speech here, you can give a speech on this landing behind and um, because of the way the section works and the plan works, most of the time you look out a window and you don't look directly at a building opposite and this is a wonderful Diego Rivera self-portrait that greets you and then just some detailing and more sort of detailing. And then, same budget, <laughs> um, more noble program. This house was sold over dinner for $65 million. So you can't say we don't make things that are valuable, aren't valuable. Um, or I don't know, there's a better, there's a line I'm looking for. So, so this is a, a, a tower for a yoga center called Kripalu. Um, it's here, it's attached to a big existing building, which is that, which we have a master plan for. It, when the sun sets on it, it glows in a kind of post-nuclear fashion. And our project is here, um, just photoshopped, but our goal was in the early going, this is a, this is a kind of treasured part of the Berkshires, was to not have our building stand out um, and then we have a master plan that's going to take that building out of play. It's basically a rectangle with two cones, um, one down the long axis and one in the short axis, which creates sort of four spaces. It, uh, the the west, western sun is kind of pinched here, the eastern sun, there's more sun there. This is the prevailing wind. You open the windows here and open them there. Uh, the, the, the ventilation, the air accelerates. This is all done with, with Matthias Schuler. Um, it's a concrete frame that's embedded with piping. 
and so there's radiant heating and radiant cooling, and that's the concrete frame clad with insulation, and then with this. It's an active facade, so um, you, you move the shutters yourself, um, and um, it's, it's, it's actually a really kind of cool and quite beautiful building, and I, because we do so much time wasting, which we call research, um, we're not always thought to be the most mercantile of architects, but I like to say that the other house sold for $65 million, which was a, almost a multiple of four, and this they is doing so well that they're able, they doubled the rates on it, and it's always full. It's very comfortable, a yoga center, a yoga studio, yoga practitioners, yoga artists, uh, lobby, uh, tiny rooms, but from the bed, from the bathroom, and from the door, you see out into the landscape, um, and there you can sort of see the air strategy. And, whoops. Okay, and then, so just uh, some houses, one in Vermont from a while ago, um, very much about in a place where some very big houses that took a lot of landscape away and changed the scale of the view. This was as much as anything trying to be discreet and to disappear in a landscape by the wonderful Dan Kiley. And then some interior stuff. We did all, all the, everything basically. Um, that steel, this is a light that is just to cast some light up into the upper part of the house. Um, a transition from a dock, a little sort of building in the water in a pond, and a wayfinding device. That's a car. And you need, um, that's to let you know where to put your foot and then to give you some support and then place to scrape your shoes. Um, and this is, so this, even more than the first one, even more than that other house, this is a house, uh, this one on Martha's Vineyard, where, whoops, where is, I'm missing an image. Well, it's um, lower than we were allowed to, to build. Um, it's completely encroached upon by landscape. It's right on the ocean. And the job of it, in terms of its exterior, is to please certain people, so to look like a vineyard building. And it looks like this shed as much as anything. Um, to disappear as much as possible um, because we think that you go to the vineyard for the landscape, rarely for the buildings. And then from within to be as transparent, so corners open and um, it's massively sort of uh, open to the water and as you can see sort of grown over. Um, very, not very small, but quite small, about uh, under 3,000 square feet. And then nearby, uh, not long after we were hired to do uh, this house on, uh, on a bluff, um, and it, we did it out of concrete partly that it, that to allow it to be overgrown, and this is again, this is with working with Michael Van Valkenburg. The last was with Dan Kiley, um, a character you might know about, you sh should know about. It has a hairy roof that's just beginning. Um, it is, uh, so it has many kind of paradoxes. It's incredibly robust. The concrete's not very good, by the way, but I think that's okay. It's kind of gnarly, like the landscape. The landscape on the vineyard is really aggressive. Um, but it's but it's massively operable. So every one of these these windows will tilt almost to horizontal. This slides out of the way. Um, that's the way through. That's and but the but so how did we do? Why did we do it out of concrete? And how did we get away with doing it out of concrete? Uh, to different questions. I I'm 
very fond of concrete and think it's still one of the great mater materials now of the 21st century, although it's got a kind of yeah, ecological uh, or an energy issue, a carbon issue. It's quite carbon intensive to make. But in this case, when the bluff collapses, you'll be able to lift this building in pieces. And uh, onto a new foundation, they own the property adjacent. There's already a plan for where that would go. And all of the interior fittings would stay. Um, all the plumbing fixtures, all the electrical fixtures, um, all the cabinetry. And so, and when we did this, the bluffs weren't collapsing so fast. Climate change is sort of accelerating these kinds of de um, decay. De uh, um, so it, this is, it's beginning to get overgrown. And, but, but again, it just opens up. Th th this is a remote field, so it's not some, a place anyone can see, but it's quite nice to sit there and you can see out to the ocean. And every one of these, th this window opens, they're just big windows that if they pivot, they come almost horizontal. And if they're anything like this, just disappears into the wall. And, and Richard is right uh, in terms of the spatial stuff. There, there's a, a uh, this is set up so that at the intersection, the corridor, the transverse corridor is orthogonal. The one that goes, when we couldn't, we had to build on this sort of narrow strip. This corridor is pinched and then gets wider and wider. So at the very end, which is, west but facing the woods, there's a huge eight foot by eight foot piece of glass which slides open and a screen if you want which slides open. So it's a kind of funny perspective. It seems very close because the taper is in that direction. We push these two pieces out of the way so that way back where the bedrooms are, when you're looking out, you think the house ends here. Um, it descends along with the landscape it's massively, op op well, it's massively operable everywhere, but this opens, that opens, the breezes go through, you can smell the ocean, and you can hear the waves. That's, that's the corridor. And there's a skylight which opens, and, you can, and it rains in there in the summer. And then another one similar out of wood, um, different strategy really on an incredible piece of land. We've been hired by people who seem to have very good sense of pieces of land. Um, I don't know. Anyway, we're sort of a, sort of, we're a minor, we're minor cult figures on the vineyard. Um, so this is a piece that goes into this, what's called, um, Cape Pogue uh, Pond, Cape Pogue Bay. And it empties and fills right here. And the, this is the site of the house. That's what it looks like. And the strategy was, it's, this is not particularly good, but this was a meadow. And there was a house here that was much higher than this one that was built 20 years ago and was just falling down. And the road went up and you parked in front of that car and you could see the house and the cars from the road. With Michael Van Valkenburg, we elected to uh, take the road out of here and snake it through the trees, which are these beautiful live oak trees. So, and then adjust the landscape so you wouldn't see the house. So from, a, a, the, nobody drives on this road, but even if you do, you never see the house. So in effect, we're trying to make the island a little bigger by taking one of the, one of the objects in it out of play. We're, for the house itself, we're, we're taking the cars. You arrive in this court, which is just made by a utility building and a garage, and you can put the cars anywhere you want. And then you, so from the house, you can never see the cars. And then, whoops. And you go between those two buildings and you gently rise through the landscape. This is all, I don't have good photographs of it with everything grown in, but this, these are just, this is just field grass and it's a very gentle stair. And you get to about here 
and your head is just at the level of the floor and you can see the horizon. You get to the next landing and you can see um, the ocean and, and, and so on and so forth. And then we built a, it's a stair that goes down the bluff. And then some of us inside. It's very complicated. It's very, it's very simple on one level, but it's extremely dense and compact. Um, a lot of bedrooms, almost dorm-like. This is a, a bathroom here. I don't know, this thing stopped working, but where you see the translucency is that. Um, and a piece of glass was supposed to be translucent, but it's not quite translucent enough, but the clients enjoy the exhibitionism that's possible as a consequence. And then this is steel, it's allowing those things to happen, and things that open a lot. Same flooring inside and out. And again, this kind of operability, which takes and a beautiful table that we built, which is just a bunch, about 10 pieces of teak. You can see the, the leg coming through. And so for the summer, these things are effectively just instruments for people to be in the landscape. So massive operability makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, again, we're trying to take them out of the view, both from the water and from the road. And then there's a little boathouse, which is just a sort of theater for kids. Behind me is where the boats are. And then we're done here now, just a few minutes on Turkey. Um, so we, we've been working on a project in Turkey for three years. Really hard. Um, um, yes, of course, and certainly mean something that would be bleaked on Jon Stewart's Daily Show. Um, so whatever is promised, you just you can't expect to ha have happened. But a, another incredible sight, um, a main house, a guest house, a landscape that we're trying to save in the middle, uh, a, a main pool, a private pool, a, a guest house pool, very theatrical pool, private pool, and you drive up through here. Um, off the grid, radiant heating, radiant cooling, enough cooling to cool the house with all the doors and windows open when it's about 100 degrees, brings it down to under 80 inside. Very sophisticated stuff, all Matthias Schuler. So this is data which I can't translate for you. We put a weather station up there for six months, gathered data which the, for this particular site allowed us to uh, take data from other weather stations in Turkey and build a 10-year model of uh, weather uh, weather patterns and project into the future. So uh, solar panels on the roof, uh, cisterns under the pools, um, geothermal, uh, and piping in the entire concrete structure. I can't tell you what that means. Um, here are the guys doing the concrete. Piping is pretty straightforward. A guy with a Game Boy here running the concrete. Solar panels all invisible, except if you climb up on the roof. It's, uh, everything is concrete there. It's actually not bad. It's actually good concrete. Uh, that's the pool, so perimeter, a gutter all the way around, a big bench for socializing, stair down, and that's a, a rendering of it. Um, and a lot of attention paid to creating shade. And then this is the, that was the guest house. This is the, that's the pool that I pointed to. And there's a sort of, these are three speakers and this is a theater. There's a, a fair amount of interest in movies. And that's the pool with water in it, which is the first time I realized I really paid attention to James Terrell. There's some railings not yet up. 
but you don't but you don't you don't need them here right that's your way down in the water and this is so that's it Sorry, sorry for no conclusion. I just was happy to get through. Happy to take questions if anyone. Happy. Hi. Um. Thank you very much for your talk. My question probably won't be so interesting for the Canadians here, but I've recently been to Montreal and I loved the. Um, the waterfront at the old port and down the Lachine Canal. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you think about it today as it is, you know, as it has embedded itself into Montreal and the part that it plays in the city. Um, well, ha um, you know, at the point about being strategic, I think, or the reason to try and understand the, as much as you can about a problem is to uh, affect the long-term outcome. I mean, it's a bit like medicine, except that sometimes the evidence isn't so easily seen and the, and the time frame is longer. But I would say I couldn't be more pleased with what uh, happened along the canal. Um, it was really, I mean, nothing was valuable along the, the, the water was sort of non-water, it was polluted, the banks were collapsing, and it wasn't just, I, I was not the only person who did that, but I, I mean, I, with some, quite a lot of help, fought to dig up the canal and to begin to dig it up and restore it. And what's happened is that every, everything along the canal, so the value of downtown, in a way, has extended all the way along the canal. So I think that's kind of terrific. As for the waterfront itself, those things are quite unpredictable. It often seems a little kitschy to me, but, it, but, I, but in terms of how it's used, uh, the bike paths and the parks, I think it's kind of fabulous. And there's a battle we lost, actually, which was that we wanted to move the train track to a place that didn't, wouldn't, be, wouldn't interfere so much. And it still is kind of in the way. You couldn't do that back then. But, but I'm, I think it's as good as, as uh, I mean, I'm extremely proud of it. I think it's one of the most important things I did. And there's not much evidence of a design hand in it, but as a piece of strategic thinking and infrastructural work, I think it's very good. I, I can tell you about many things I've done that really haven't turned out so well. <laughs> also. I have a Some by you. Hi. Uh, with the research that you're doing about the uh, construction and making it more efficient, um, I, I think I understood that they are moving towards uh, maybe some kind of prototype or like a, a product of a house that can be built quickly. But I'm wondering if, if in the research you've uh, maybe discovered some things that you didn't know about before uh, for, for building more efficiently uh, that's affected your work as you're doing it uh, even before you get to the point of designing this kind of prototype for a, a house. Um, we, we've just, first of all, we've just barely begun that, and this, the research I'm showing you is mostly research we did in order to get the job. Um, we were trying to convince these people. There were 12 teams in a, uh, on the long list and th three or four on a short list. And, uh, and it wasn't, they weren't really asking. The question was not as broad as that. Um, in fact, the Helsinki competition was for a building on a particular site. And I refer to the, the Helsinki conundrum uh, of 
being asked a question that you know isn't really the right question and choosing to answer the question you wished had been asked. So we, the Helsinki competition was an answer to a question they didn't ask, which was if you want to really take sustainability seriously, you have to redo the master plan. So for this other project, initially it was a bit the Helsinki conundrum as well. The funding agency really saw this as a way, uh, uh, saw making prototypes of prefabricated housing as their mission. And we, in an earlier, sort of took a risk and said, uh, but they also said they want to disrupt the house. This is a big financial organization. And they said their goal was to disrupt the housing industry, in one of our terms these days, disrupt, start up, innovate, forget, there's a whole list of them. And I wrote, we wrote to them and said that we'd be, we, would, we were very good at doing housing and we know how to build and we know how to make things that are appealing. We understand cultural forces and social forces, but that if they wanted to disrupt building a better prefab factory to build a better prefab house was not likely to do that. And they didn't kick us off the list. Um, and ultimately, they've hired us. So I, but I, I don't know, I mean, many, many discoveries. I, I'm just astounded by the efficiencies in those businesses. I had no idea, you know, that Apple's spending $7 to assemble an iPhone out of 560 bucks. Just mind-boggling. Um, I had no idea that Rover um, was partnered with DHL. Actually, I didn't know they were partnered with DHL. I had no idea about sort of supply chain theory and supply chain practice um, or, or logistics, the role of logistics in these businesses. And so what I would say is it seems really interesting and it seems really promising and when you look at the data on construction and, and how, what a laggard it is as an industry compared to others, you're very optimistic. When you look at all the people who've tried to change it and failed, you become a little bit more pessimistic. So, But I'm, I am sort of quite, I'm thrilled to be doing this and we're working with people in fields far beyond our own. Be, should be a very interesting, and, and by a process that I think is going to be very interesting. But I know almost nothing at this point. You had a question? You kind of answered my question. Oh. Because um, uh, it, it was about the, uh, the housing research, but um, I wonder if you think it's also the case, because we have some people that are, that are both builders and um, designers of large-scale housing and large-scale projects, whether the level of innovation is, is as um, um, timid in larger scales of construction that, that as, as you're saying it is in the, in the construction of the, in the, in the, in the, in the single-family housing yeah. industry. I think it's better. You know, I, I mean, I'm persuaded that guys like Alan have really hammered the system and I think, I think also the higher the building, the more likely it is that the more repetitive it is and the more you can systematize it. We're looking at sort of up to six stories and, as, and up to, you know, maybe a couple of million square feet. It, as, and, and actually we're looking for language, that's interesting. Boeing has a factory and a construction site is sort of a factory, but I'm trying to find a way to give them the same terminology. So my current best I can do, best we can do so far is site of final assembly. Because Boeing isn't, it's not like an old factory where they're putting everything together or like what Detroit was. They're assembling a lot of stuff that's been pre-assembled, sub-assembled in other places. So unfortunately, someone pointed out to me that site of final assembly as an acronym is SOFA. Which I <laughs> so not a good start. But, I, but, I, but I, so I think tall buildings 
are much better. I'm, what's really interesting is that if I'm not mistaken, the Empire State Building was built in a, like a year and two months. And I can't remember exactly how that happened, but people, th that, was not, that was not done uh, haphazardly. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.